While such an approach is superficially appealing, it often ignores deeper layers of organizational failure. Cohen and Gooch make an important point, since modern military commanders rarely exercise absolute power over their forces and are unable to survey the entire battlefield over which they exercise command. In addition, as militaries have grown more complex to tackle larger, more demanding missions, their internal systems doctrine, training, staff operations, even how a group of aircraft is spotted and launched from a flight deck, have grown more complex as well, and thereby more prone to failure. This is certainly true of the Japanese at Midway. This is not to say that individuals did not make mistakes. But by the same token, upon closer examination, it is clear that it wasn't just Yamamoto or Genda who failed at Midway in several important ways. The entire institution of the Japanese Navy was to blame as well. Cohen and Gooch propose that all military failures fall into three basic categories. Failure to learn from the past, failure to anticipate what the future may bring, and failure to adapt to the immediate circumstances on the battlefield. They further note that when one of these three basic failures occurs in isolation, known as a simple failure, the results, while unpleasant, can often also be overcome. Aggregate failures occur when two of the basic failure types, usually learning and anticipation, take place simultaneously, and these are more difficult to surmount. Finally, at the apex of failure, stand those rare events when all three basic failures occur simultaneously, an event known as catastrophic failure. In such an occurrence, the result is usually a disaster of such scope that recovery is impossible. Sadly for the Japanese, Midway must join the ignominious ranks of this level of calamitous compound failure. The first of these deadly military sins, failure to learn, indicates that a military has been either unable or unwilling to adequately address the lessons of the past. This may stem from a frank inability to understand or adequately analyse what actually went wrong or right in earlier campaigns. Alternately, a military organisation may be forced by tradition, politics or other impediments to put the blinders on, thereby hampering its self-analysis and performance in future operations. Examined in this light, it is clear that the Imperial Navy's failure to draw correct conclusions from the past stemmed in large part from its crowning naval triumph at Tsushima in 1905. From that decisive victory, the Japanese drew three fundamental conclusions that would ultimately lead them to decisive defeat. First, Tsushima seemed to confirm the notion that naval power could be used to shape and control conflicts so that they remained localised and were fought for limited objectives. The Japanese Navy's role in the Russo-Japanese War was to isolate the Korean peninsula, thwart the activities of the Russian squadrons at Port Arthur and Vladivostok, and fight a decisive battle with the main Russian battle fleet when it finally appeared near the home islands. In this role, it was eminently successful, and the war was largely fought on ground chosen by the Japanese. Second, Tsushima falsely taught the lesson that victory at sea devolved solely from winning climactic fleet engagements. This lesson seemed inescapable, since Tsushima was one of the most decisive naval battles in history, resulting in the utter annihilation of the Russian fleet. At the negligible cost of three torpedo boats sunk, moderate damage to three capital ships and some other smaller combatants, and the deaths of one ten sailors. Japan had caused 34 of the 38 Russian vessels that entered the Straits of Tsushima to be either sunk, scuttled, captured or interned. Over 10,000 Russian sailors were either killed or captured. Very shortly thereafter, Russia had been forced to initiate peace negotiations. If Tsushima seemed to prove anything, it was that a single battle could determine the fate of two antagonists. Indeed, in the Japanese view, a single battle was likely to determine the outcome of the war as a whole. Third, Tsushima implanted in the Imperial Navy the unfailing belief in the primacy of offensive factors as compared to defensive considerations. In that battle, the superior speed of the Japanese battle line had allowed it to manoeuvre freely and had been critical in dictating the gunnery range to the Russians. By the same token, Japan's unorthodox adoption of relatively lightweight main battery ammunition, whose armour penetration characteristics were inferior, but whose weight of explosive charge was much greater, 
had inflicted enormous damage to the upper works and control centres of the Russian battleships, thereby throwing the enemy line into confusion. Thus, the Japanese believed that by bringing greater firepower to bear at decisive ranges, they would be able to defeat more numerous opponents. The seeds of this dogma had already been planted during the Navy's formative years, as the Japanese naturally adopted the policies of their mentor, the Royal Navy, which advocated an aggressive attitude toward naval engagements. But Tsushima cemented the notion that big guns were the final arbiter of any naval encounter, a belief further reinforced by the clash of heavily armed battle lines at Jutland. These three lessons were later fused unhealthily with Japan's growing fixation after the First World War on the possibility of war with the United States. The Japanese understood that any such conflict would pit them against a foe whose numerical superiority was ultimately ensured by overwhelming industrial might. Seeing no way to fight numbers with numbers, the Imperial Navy fell back on the unswerving belief that quality if wielded with superior skill and Japanese fighting spirit Yamato Damashi must be able to defeat quantity. From this fundamental belief flowed every doctrinal and warship design tenet in the Imperial Navy. As a result, the other traditional roles that great navies throughout history have embraced protecting one's commerce, destroying the commerce of the enemy, and conducting amphibious landings were strictly subjugated to the Imperial Navy's overriding need to augment the fleet's raw offensive strength. Speed, range and firepower were everything. The problem was that none of these dictums was appropriate in the context of a global war in the Pacific, particularly a protracted one. In the matter of using naval power to limit the scope of a conflict, it is ironic that Japan's opening moves in the Pacific War had exactly the opposite effect. By attacking Pearl Harbor, the Imperial Navy unilaterally ensured that the scope of the war it unleashed would be unlimited. Now, instead of having to control a limited number of seaways that led to a single geographic centre of gravity such as Korea had been in 1904-05, Japan had elected to wage war across the entire expanse of the Pacific. Under these circumstances, any geographical prescription of the conflict was impossible. As for the cherished notion of creating a single decisive battle that would decide the course of the war, the Imperial Navy searched in vain throughout the conflict for such an engagement first at Midway, and then elsewhere. The Japanese completely failed to understand that a power like the United States could never be brought to ruin or even to the bargaining table as the result of a single engagement, no matter how successful it was. The industrialised, massively mobilised nature of World War II ensured that protracted warfare was practically inevitable. In such a setting, nations could be defeated only after the application of levels of cumulative force and destruction that beggared the imagination. The third lesson from Tsushima manifested itself in the Imperial Navy's continuing overemphasis on offensive factors. At the strategic level, this meant that its naval force structure, while formidable in frontline strength, did not possess the characteristics needed for the protracted war it had unwittingly purchased for itself. And operationally, it meant that Japan came to Midway armed with a doctrinal outlook rigidly inclined toward the offensive. This is evidenced by Gender's esquiole of wasting air assets on scouting operations, Nagumo's obvious preference for a coordinated counterstrike against the Americans. Even at the expense of speed, and the fact that Japan's warships were ill-prepared to accept battle damage and survive, all of these factors had deleterious effects at Midway. However, perhaps the most important learning failure of the Imperial Navy concerned lessons not from prior wars, but rather from the first five months of the Pacific War itself. At the top of this list must stand the Navy's inability to correctly perceive the underlying reasons for its success up until April 1942. Granted, the Japanese had never fought a carrier versus carrier battle prior to Coral Sea. Yet, operational mass was clearly the key to its two most successful campaigns of the initial war period, Pearl Harbor and the Indian Ocean foray. On both of these occasions, Japan had equipped Kido Butai with every available fleet carrier in the inventory, and in the process had presented its opponents with an insuperable tactical problem. Japan had won not because of its racial superiority or Yamato Damashi, 
but because the Imperial Navy brought more flight decks and more aircraft to the point of contact than its enemies could muster in return. By the same token, when the Japanese had attacked with marginal forces most notably at the Battle of Coral Sea, but also in such land operations as the protracted siege of Bataan and the initial abortive invasion of Wake Island, they had found the going much tougher. One might argue that at Coral Sea, the Japanese did not actually believe their forces were going to be marginal to the task, given the anticipated level of opposition. But this merely betrays the Japanese failure to appreciate the capacity of modern carrier forces to move across vast distances and launch powerful raids deep behind the nominal front line. As was pointed out earlier, the only way for the Japanese to avoid being outnumbered and ambushed by a suddenly appearing enemy carrier task force that wasn't supposed to be there was to bring the entirety of their own carrier force to every major operation. There really was no middle ground in terms of force allocation. Thus, without realising it, the Japanese had ironically disproved their own cherished notion of quality triumphing over quantity. Instead, quantity had arguably been the critical factor in Japan's seminal victories to date. Given that fact, bringing the entire carrier force to an operation such as Midway was absolutely imperative. An astute naval leadership would have noticed this correlation, but the Imperial Navy did not. Whether the cause was victory disease or a simple disinterest in learning lessons at this stage of the conflict, the result was a lessening of intellectual rigour in the Navy during the first part of 1942. An accurate perception of the strengths of massing many carrier decks together should have inclined the Japanese toward a policy of fighting fewer battles, but carrying a bigger stick to each. Instead, the Imperial Navy exhibited a penchant for doing precisely the opposite. The battles of Coral Sea and Midway make it clear that the Japanese Navy was going after too many objectives at once. It was dispersing its carrier assets, thereby casting aside its proven formula for victory. In the process, it was unnecessarily elevating the Navy's risk by placing irreplaceable combat assets in situations where its weaker opponent could temporarily concentrate superior numbers against them. The fault in this respect can rightly be laid primarily at the feet of Admiral Yamamoto, for it was he who had the dominant hand in crafting the Navy's strategy. Yet it is apparent that Naval General Headquarters played a role as well, because it was they who persuaded Yamamoto to take on operations like Coral Sea and Operation AI, both of which would detract from the overall strength that the Navy could wield against primary objectives. Not only did Yamamoto accept these extra burdens with minimal protest, but when he did argue against them, it was never because they dispersed his available carrier power, but because they did not figure into his overall conception for how a decisive battle was to be contrived. Had he been wise, he would have vigorously contested all such secondary operations as being truly dangerous to Japan's overall strategic calculus. For this reason alone, Yamamoto should never have countenanced independent operations by Carrier Division 5. By the same token, Naval General Headquarters should not have pushed the matter. For the fundamental truth remains that had Carrier Division 5 been present in its entirety at Midway, it is difficult to see how the Americans could have won, despite their superior intelligence and demonstrable luck. But neither Yamamoto nor Naval General Headquarters apparently realised that preservation of Japan's critical offensive mass was essential to its ability to conduct decisive battles. There is a further irony, however, in that Yamamoto and Naval General Headquarters' failure to appreciate the virtues of mass at the operational level was matched by an overemphasis on conservation of mass by Nagumo and his staff at the tactical level. In fact, both of these tendencies had a dire impact on the outcome of the battle. On the face of it, this seems contradictory mass should be either good or bad. But this points out the difficulty of meeting out simple prescriptions for victory or defeat in this very complex battle. Had Yamamoto supplied his subordinate with true superiority of naval air power at the point of contact, it could have widened Nagumo's tactical options immensely. Likewise, had Nagumo been less concerned with launching a massed counter-strike from his four decks during the battle, his options would have been commensurately widened. Other opportunities for learning during the early part of the war had also presented themselves, although more fleetingly. <laughs>
The outcome of Coral Sea, for instance, could have been such an occasion, but for various reasons it wasn't. For one thing, after recovering from its initial fury at Admiral Takagi for supposedly failing to prosecute the battle aggressively enough, Combined Fleet staff had then swung around in fairly short order to believing that the operation had actually been another Japanese victory. In so doing, it blinded itself to its own shortcomings, particularly with regard to having adequate forces on hand, and this opportunity was complicated, of course, by the fact that the time interval between Coral Sea and Midway was so short. As such, there was scant time for the fleet to fully absorb the two most important tactical implications of the engagement, namely, that American carrier aviators should not be discounted, and that lone carrier divisions were not a replacement for a fully constituted Kido Butai. Yet, while it is true that the Japanese Navy was operating on an impossibly tight schedule, and that there was little time to absorb and process battle lessons, it is also interesting to note that the time period between the Indian Ocean operations and Midway hints at the start of a learning gap appearing between the two navies. This was a phenomenon that would become increasingly evident as the war progressed. The United States Navy as an organisation often, although not always, had a superior capacity for absorbing battle lessons and translating them into doctrinal and technical modifications that would aid it in future battles. For instance, the incident in the Indian Ocean, wherein a handful of British bombers succeeded in surprising Kido Butai and nearly bombing Akagi, should have been a wake-up call to the Japanese fleet that their air defence arrangements were inadequate. It is clear that the Japanese took notice of this incident. Hiryu's after-action report emphasised the need for better long-range detection capabilities against enemy aircraft. Yet it doesn't appear that any concerted effort was made to enhance the capabilities of the fleet's primary defence mechanism, its combat air patrol, the failure of which would doom Nagumo just two months later at Midway. It is true that two months didn't offer much time for the organisations within the Japanese Navy, responsible for producing doctrine, such as the Yokosuka Air Group, to absorb the problem and produce a response. Furthermore, before the advent of radar, and in the absence of adequate ship-to-plane communications because of substandard radios in the Zero, there was only so much that could be done to improve combat air patrol performance. Thus, complex changes in the carrier air defence arrangements certainly couldn't be expected within this time frame. By the same token, though, even some relatively simple changes at the tactical level, insisting that the fighter Shotai observe an iron discipline in maintaining their sectors and requiring them to remain stacked at prescribed altitudes, could have produced positive results at Midway. In the absence of such discipline, though, the Japanese combat air patrol operated organically and tended to overreact, thereby affording the enemy open avenues of approach. In contrast, it is striking that in the immediate aftermath of Coral Sea, Yorktown's crew was able to devise and implement a significant innovation in the area of damage control that would go on to have a major impact for the Americans. Machinist Oscar W. Myers, Yorktown's Air Department fuel officer, had observed that the demise of Lexington was the result, among other things, of an aviation gasoline fire on her hangar deck. He therefore contrived the notion of draining the fuel system after usage and filling the pipes with inert carbon dioxide gas. Yorktown's skipper, Captain Elliot Buckmaster, was quick to give his permission to this innovation, which almost certainly prevented Yorktown suffering a calamitous fire during Kobayashi's dive bomber attack on 4 June. Similarly, American fighter pilots were finally beginning to come to grips with the Japanese Zero. Though the genesis of Jimmy Thatch's famous thatch-weave manoeuvre dated from as early as November 1941, his implementation of it, albeit on a very limited scale, at Midway was symbolic of the United States Navy's efforts to learn and innovate in the face of Japan's early war superiority. This is not to imply that the Japanese Navy was incapable of learning. That was certainly not the case. But it is equally clear that at this point in the war, the accumulated pressures of six months of defeats were forcing the United States Navy to adapt frantically and often successfully. In contrast, six months of victories were not creating the same imperatives within the Imperial Navy. The overall conclusion is inescapable the Japanese Navy had a learning problem.
The cherished precepts that it had carried down from Tsushima, the value of geographically limited wars, the primacy of offensive over defensive factors, and the supremacy of big gun navies were largely inapplicable to World War II. Furthermore, at its highest levels of command, the Navy had also failed to grasp the lessons of the war they had launched. Not the least important of these principles was the overriding importance in carrier warfare of numerical superiority, despite having emphatically driven that very point home for all the world to see at Pearl Harbor. After failures of learning come those of anticipation. As Cohen and Gooch point out, the essence of a failure to anticipate is not mere ignorance of the future, for that is inherently unknowable. It is rather the failure to take reasonable precautions against a known hazard. Along with its failures in learning, it is clear that the Imperial Navy failed to anticipate as it went into the Battle of Midway. At the level of operational planning, Gender was clearly guilty of failing to foresee that a larger number of scouting aircraft would be required to implement a thorough search. Furthermore, his plans should have accommodated the possibility of variable weather conditions around the objective. Not only that, but as has been previously pointed out, Gender was bright and generally competent, as he was the product of a military culture that emphasised the preservation of offensive mass at almost all costs. Carrier attack planes could be used as scouts during transits to the battlefield, but once battle was joined, scouting with attack aircraft was to be avoided. If there weren't enough float planes to do the job, it just didn't get done. In short, if Gender's plan was flawed, it would have failed along institutionally predictable lines. More puzzling, though, is Nagumo's failure on the basis of the intelligence he had in hand before the battle to anticipate that the American carriers might be present off of Midway. It is clear that Nagumo probably ought to have been suspicious of the level of American activity in the area, if nothing else, but he chose not to act on this intelligence. In retrospect, Nagumo's indecision was probably partly the result of his own personality, which, by this point in his career, was rigid, uninspired, and unfamiliar with the technical intricacies of the force he commanded. These tendencies were further reinforced by the military culture prevailing in the Imperial Navy, which valued conformity and obedience over creativity or personal initiative. However, as Admiral Ugaki, the United States Naval War College and Walter Lord all noted, the most crucial oversight in this respect was Yamamoto's failure to take precautions against the possibility that the Americans might in fact be present off Midway in advance of their scripted arrival time in his battle plan. This was driven by his personal belief that the Americans were all but beaten and would need to be lured out to battle. As such, it was apparently inconceivable that they would be lying in wait. As was mentioned previously, Yamamoto was clearly guilty of the sin of planning operations around perceived enemy intentions, rather than on the basis of the enemy's likely capabilities. The corollary failure that flowed from this assumption was Yamamoto's decision to disperse his forces in the face of the enemy. By subdividing his superior mass into a welter of smaller formations that were not mutually supportive, the overall battle plan was unnecessarily weakened. Despite the plan's details having been created by his operations officer, Captain Kurashima Kameto, as commander-in-chief, Yamamoto must shoulder ultimate responsibility for this action. Yet it is interesting to note that throughout the war, even as their strength weakened relative to the Americans, the Japanese never lost their fondness for complex, dispersed operations. For instance, one of Yamamoto's eventual successors, Admiral Toyoda Soemu, created a similar monstrosity in 1944. Toyoda's Shogo One plan, conceived for the defence of the Philippines, featured multiple widely separated formations. Two separate battle squadrons were designed to converge on the American invasion beaches at Leyte, while Ozawa's carrier force acted as bait to lure the American fleet northward and open the way for the battleships. Japanese operations in the early battles around Java and at Coral Sea, as well as later operations in the Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz, also featured multiple Japanese formations manoeuvring without the ability to mutually reinforce one another. The conclusion from this is apparent. Had Yamamoto not been in charge of combined fleet in April-May 1942, whoever was commanding Rengo Kantai 
would likely have introduced a comparable level of complication into what ought to have been a relatively straightforward exercise. Complex operations were endemic to the Imperial Navy, not just Yamamoto. This love of intricacy can be clearly detected in the 1920s and 1930s. This is when Japanese doctrine and fleet exercises envisioned elaborate encircling manoeuvres often taking place at night unfolding like clockwork to trap the unwitting Americans. It is clear in this regard that Japanese naval strategy was influenced from its very inception by Oriental philosophies on the conduct of war, which emphasised the value of deception and indirect approaches. Akiyama Sanayuki, the most brilliant thinker at the Imperial Navy's Staff College at the turn of the 20th century, drew heavily not only on contemporary Western naval practices, but also on ancient Oriental military masters such as Sun Tzu, as he began hammering out Japanese naval strategic thought at that time. Akiyama's principles, in particular his love of indirect approaches, so as to conceal the true objective of an operation, were seen by the Japanese as laying the strategic foundation for the victory at Tsushima. From there they were carried forward into the interwar period, and obviously still exerted a powerful influence at Midway. Unfortunately, at Midway, the Japanese encountered a strategic problem where subtlety was a dangerous luxury. If ever a situation called for using brute force, this was it. But Yamamoto, shaped by his institutional training, adopted an elegant strategic approach that suited his service's martial sensibilities, and it is likely that any other graduate of the Imperial Naval Staff College would have done likewise. In a nutshell, Japanese naval strategy was warped and was likely to produce unworkable solutions no matter who was in charge of the planning. In this sense, Chihaya's complaint that the Japanese navy had as good as planned for its defeat at Midway is true, but the reasons for that defeat reached back well before six months of overweening pride brought them into focus. Instead, they had been built into the navy's strategic outlook over the course of decades. One failure of anticipation, though, cannot be traced to institutional roots. This was Yamamoto's and Ugaki's high-handed behaviour during the May War Games on board Yamato. Wargaming, when used objectively, is one of the most important tools at the disposal of a professional military, revealing unforeseen dangers and developing contingency plans to guard against them. In this vein, the May Games were ostensibly intended to prepare the fleet's tactical commanders for the coming operation, yet from the very outset, Combined fleet's midway games were a farce. Rather than being approached honestly and openly, the entire exercise was subordinated to the overriding political agendas of Admiral Yamamoto. The games were merely a tool for pushing combined fleet's operational concepts through, no matter what objections might be raised. Late-issued operational plans and blatantly rigged officiating not only led to the sullen resignation of Admiral Nagumo from the proceedings, but also to a sense that the remainder of the participants were merely going through the motions. Thus, Combined Fleet's commander-in-chief willfully mishandled one of his most useful analytical tools on the eve of his most important battle. Only a single insight worthy of the name emerged from this entire exercise, the awareness that if an American carrier force appeared unexpectedly on Nagumo's flank, it could produce very unpleasant consequences for the operation as a whole. But that realisation merely resulted in the issuance of a slapdash verbal instruction, namely, that Nagumo should keep half of his aircraft armed for a naval strike at all times. During the actual battle, this same instruction did little except needlessly restrict the force commander's options. Thus, Yamamoto's sole attempt to rise to the challenge of anticipating the enemy's actions was counterproductive. In sum, the Japanese Navy was clearly guilty of several crucial errors of anticipation. Gender's anemic reconnaissance scheme, Yamamoto's obtuse battle plan, even Kaga's unlikely resurrection at the hand of Ugaki during the May War Games, all were indicative of a navy that had failed miserably to foresee what the future might bring. Instead, they habitually assumed that a best-case rather than a worst-case scenario would unfold in their favour a bad idea in military planning. Thus, the Japanese came to Midway with a flawed doctrine, having drawn the wrong conclusions from the past, and having failed to absorb the most critical lesson from the current conflict. Failure 1. Moreover, 
their battle plan was similarly flawed and did not consider contingencies such as the American fleet being present off of Midway, failure too. Nevertheless, despite these glaring problems, Nagumo still might have won the battle, or at least have made the outcome more even if the Japanese had been able to adapt to the challenge of their changed circumstances. After all, even without Shokaku and Zuikaku, the four carriers of Kido Butai were still the most powerful, proficient naval air force on the planet. But here too, the Imperial Navy failed on several levels, both strategically immediately before the battle and operationally during its course. By far the most important reason for these adaptive failures was an unhealthy rigidity on the part of the Japanese regarding the sanctity of battle plans. Indeed, this is a common theme for the Imperial military that can be seen not only at Midway, but throughout the Pacific War as well. Plan inertia, for want of a better term, was endemic to the mindset of the Imperial Navy and was the result of many factors. First, while characterizing a culture in general terms is always suspect, it is probably safe to say that Japanese society prizes order above most things. Furthermore, it is demonstrable that the Japanese as a people, from the youngest to the oldest, intensely dislike making mistakes, particularly in public. Plans like social rituals are a natural way of establishing and codifying order and minimizing mistakes. This keenness on planning still manifests itself today in Japan, with many large Japanese corporations creating business plans that in some cases attempt to look into the future for decades far longer than the five-year horizons considered typical for large Western businesses. Likewise, while the degree of actual control Japan's post-war Ministry of International Trade and Industry had during the decades of Japan's economic miracle may be arguable. The fact that Japan was one of the few capitalists industrialized nations to engage in a systematic exercise in national economic planning is not. Not surprisingly, these central cultural tendencies manifested themselves from the very beginnings of the Imperial Navy. Furthermore, the Navy's plans had been seen as paying substantial benefits throughout that time. It was good planning that had allowed the Japanese to beat the Russians, particularly at Tsushima, but more generally through the creation of the highly cohesive, tactically homogeneous battle force that fought that war. In the same vein, the interwar navy had put great store in policies such as the 8-8 fleet. This had sought during the years between 1907 and 1922 to create a powerful fleet of eight new dreadnoughts and eight battlecruisers with which to counterweigh American naval power in the Pacific. The notion of the 8-8 fleet, the underlying rationale for which was actually fairly abstract and questionable, had become an unquestioned article of faith in the Navy up until the time the Washington Naval Treaty did away with it. This same tendency resurrected itself during the 1930s in the form of increasingly ambitious naval replenishment plans, known informally as circle plans, Maru Kekaku, which greatly expanded the power of the fleet immediately before the war. On a more day-to-day -day basis, the Navy's annual operational plan, Nendo Sakusen Keikaku, which was in force from 1 April to the following 31st March of each year, defined in great detail the Navy's activities for the following year. Drawn up by the Navy General Staff, the plan detailed the training to be carried out, manoeuvres to be held, and the tactical problems to be solved thereby. Included in each were also detailed prescript orders for first mobilising the fleet, Suishi Jumbi preparatory fleet mobilization, and then shifting it over to wartime hostilities, Nendo Teikoku Kaigun Senji Henson, annual Imperial Navy plan for wartime organization. During any given year, of course, the Navy was expected to be devoting itself to attaining the tactical proficiency necessary to win the decisive battle, many of whose tactical precepts had become increasingly scripted and choreographed as the 1930s went on. This love of planning had paid handsome results during the opening moves of the Pacific War for both Japanese service branches. The proficiency demonstrated during the attack on Pearl Harbor is the most famous example of this. Admiral Yamamoto, and more particularly Captain Kurashima Kameto, had taken a bold operational vision and hammered it into a sound operational plan in very short order. Pearl Harbor introduced the revolutionary use of massed carrier air power, 
as well as tactical innovations, like the famous use of wooden fins that enabled air-dropped torpedoes to operate in the shallow waters of the harbour. No less inspired was the Imperial Army's routing of the British in Malaya, an invasion force on bicycles harrying a professional army twice its size to utter destruction in just nine weeks, which was built around a core of solid staff work completed before the war. In the course of these planning exercises, the Japanese army had identified key overland attack routes, as well as the degree of combat engineering, particularly bridge building, capabilities that would be required to win the campaign. All of these efforts had resulted in brilliant and well-deserved victories, yet too much of any good thing can have its drawbacks, and it is clear that the Japanese held their plans in such high regard that once in place, they were loath to alter them. This manifested itself in Yamamoto's failure to adapt to the setback at Coral Sea. By not allowing Operation MI's timetable to slip, he lost the chance to include either member of Carrier Division 5 in the starting lineup, and thus condemned Nagumo to fight on even terms at Midway, rather than from a position of strength. By the same token, Yamamoto's failure to adjust to Nagumo's one-day delay in sailing meant that Tanaka's invasion force was prematurely exposed to detection, which confirmed the Americans in their suspicions that Japanese carriers could shortly be expected off midway. Neither did he adjust his plans when it became evident Operation K would fail to produce timely information on the disposition of the American fleet. At an operational level, plan inertia manifested itself in a stubborn unwillingness to adapt immediately before and during battle, Karl von Clausewitz's famous maxim that no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy probably never met with a less enthusiastic audience than the Imperial Navy. Obviously, Vice Admiral Nagumo had his share of difficulties in this respect. Besides his unwillingness to act on his latest intelligence estimates, Nagumo also failed in two other critical respects. First, he didn't launch a quick counter-strike against the Americans when the occasion demanded. Second, by closing directly on the Americans once they were discovered, he manoeuvred his force in such a way as to expose it to greater danger than was prudent. In both of these instances, of course, he was influenced by prevailing Japanese doctrine, which favoured closing aggressively with the enemy and delivering a coordinated, annihilating blow. Yamaguchi, of course, did not adapt successfully to his circumstances either. By failing to carefully gauge the strength of Hiryu and her air group, he placed his force in an increasingly dangerous position, with little chance of commensurate reward. Yamaguchi stands as the archetypal Japanese warrior in this respect aggressive, unwilling or unable to back down, and more concerned with preserving his own personal honour than preserving the combat assets of the nation. And as has been shown, contrary to the prevailing view of the battle, Nagumo was his co-equal in this aggressiveness. Even when the long odds against his success militated strongly for an expeditious withdrawal. British Field Marshal William Slim, who had been defeated in Burma by the Japanese in early 1942, but who would later return the favour by crushing them in the same theatre in 1944, beautifully captured the spirit of his enemies in an excerpt written about the Japanese army. He remarked, The Japanese were ruthless and bold as ants while their designs went well, but if their plans were disturbed or thrown out ant-like again, they fell into confusion, were slow to readjust themselves, and invariably clung too long to their original schemes. This to commanders with their unquenchable military optimism, which rarely allowed in their narrow administrative margins for any setback or delay, was particularly dangerous. The fundamental fault of their generalship was a lack of morals, as distinct from physical courage. They were not prepared to admit that they had made a mistake, that their plans had misfired and needed recasting. Rather than confess that, they passed on to their subordinates, unchanged, the order that they themselves had received, well knowing that with the resources available, the tasks demanded were impossible. Time and again, this blind passing of responsibility ran down a chain of disaster. They scored highly by determination. They paid heavily for lack of flexibility. This passage might just as easily have been written about Midway, as it perfectly encapsulates the problems the Japanese had when it came to altering their battle plans. In the matter of lack of moral courage, 
Yamamoto, Nagumo and Yamaguchi were all quite clearly guilty as charged. Equally perceptive is Slim's insight that sticking with a plan, even a bad plan, was a mechanism whereby the Japanese individual could personally absolve himself of responsibility for a defeat. Too often, though, the price for doing so was needless casualties, or even the outright destruction of one's force, typically followed by the atoning suicide of the commander in question. All in all, this was not an effective model for winning a war against a numerically superior opponent. By the same token, it is clear from many of the failures of learning and adaptation just discussed that the Japanese entered the Battle of Midway wearing doctrinal handcuffs, the effect of which was to retard still further their ability to innovate. Whereas American doctrine is generally presented to a commander as a codification of guidelines concerning the effective conduct of combat, the very nature of the Japanese military culture made its own doctrine far more rigid with regards to interpretation. This manifested itself in Nagumo and Gender's disinclination to augment their tactical scouting assets with carrier strike assets, even in the face of accumulating evidence that the Americans were more alert than they ought to have been. In the same way, the apparent unwillingness of 1st Air Fleet staff to even consider splitting the attacking power of Kido Butai after discovering the Americans later in the morning originated in doctrinal imperatives. Launching a quick attack against the Americans with Carrier Division 2's Kanbaku before Tomonaga's recovery, difficult though this would have been to implement, might have given the Japanese their best possibility to inflict more harm on their opponent than they actually managed. Yet Japanese doctrine prescribed massed air power as the correct answer to any tactical problem that arose, and Nagumo and his staff dogmatically stuck to that formula. Likewise, Nagumo's doctrinaire decision to close directly on the Americans had the effect of leaving his fleet positioned between two hostile forces, Midway and the American carriers. A decision to manoeuvre more freely, either to the north or northwest, could have mitigated some of the advantages that the Americans had accrued by virtue of the superior and wholly intentional initial positioning. Despite the Japanese love of indirect approaches at a strategic level, their love of closing directly to knife-fighting range at the tactical level was never better demonstrated than at Midway. Some of these problems stemmed from the simple fact that in early 1942, the aircraft carrier was still a brand new weapon system. As such, the body of doctrinal thinking in all the carrier navies was relatively small and still maturing. Other navies might have viewed an immature doctrine as being a tacit admission that some degree of interpretation by unit commanders would be required during the course of battle. The Japanese apparently did not see things this way they stuck to the playbook, small as it might be. When improvisation was called for, they answered with the most expedient and transparent tactic available charging the enemy. Thus, in the critical matter of adaptation, the Japanese likewise failed abysmally. Taken as a whole, the inescapable conclusion that emerges from a careful examination of the battle is the fact that the Japanese defeat was not the result of some solitary, crucial breakdown in Japanese designs. It was not the result of victory disease, nor of a few crucial personal mistakes. Rather, what appears is a complex, comprehensive web of failures stretching across every level of the battle strategic, operational and tactical. Every aspect of the enterprise was tainted in some way. The surface manifestations of these deeper failures may ultimately have been a host of mistakes committed by individuals. And some of those mistakes were clearly more important than others, but the vast majority of them were in some way symptomatic of larger failures within the Japanese military and within the Navy's cultural fabric, its doctrine, and its preferred modes of combat. They were the end products of an organisation that failed to learn correctly from its past, failed to plan correctly for its future, and then failed to adapt correctly to circumstances once those plans were shown to be flawed. Intriguingly, the seeds of many of these errors had been planted some 40 years before, through the initial teachings of the Japanese Naval Staff College, and from the flower of Japan's greatest victory, the Battle of Tsushima. They had lain unnoticed all that time, growing unchecked, waiting for the right time, place and individuals to give them expression. Instead of culling these warped seedlings, the Japanese Navy had fostered their growth in the 1930s.
The twin pressures of a violent nationalism, combined with the sure knowledge that they would be the underdog in any war with America, had conspired to skew Japan's naval policies and doctrines still further during that time period. As a result, by the time the Pacific War began, and despite its undoubted tactical prowess, the Navy's ability to mentally fight the war at a strategic and operational level was already fatally damaged. It was at Midway that the breadth of these shortcomings finally revealed themselves, with catastrophic results for both the Imperial Navy and the Japanese nation. Of course, in the larger context of the war, the Battle of Midway was just one of the first of a much greater harvest of bitter fruit that would fall from the poison tree of Japanese militarism. The military defeats that began with the Battle of Midway stem from the harsh reality that, far from being the truly modern progressive institution that it fondly imagined itself to be, the Imperial Navy was in fact possessed of the most parochial of outlooks. Instead of the quick, limited war Japan's military leadership envisioned, the Pacific War soon revealed itself to be all-encompassing and all-consuming. In a shockingly short time, America had begun waging war against Japan across every strategic dimension available to a great industrial power military, political, economic, and scientific. Japan was assaulted on the ground, through the air, and on and under the sea. Ultimately, it was beaten decisively in every one of these arenas. In this sense, Midway was merely symptomatic of the Imperial military's larger failings. Most obvious was their fatally misguided decision to launch a war of aggression against the most powerful nation on earth. Having done so, moreover, they found themselves engaged in a conflict whose scope and complexity forced its participants to evolve at a frenetic pace. As it developed, for the Japanese this was a particularly daunting challenge. Despite the amazing speed with which they had modernised their fighting forces after 1848, they were still bound by thought patterns linked to an earlier military and cultural era, as well as the warped legacy of Tsushima. In the final analysis, it is no exaggeration to say that the conflict the Japanese military instigated in 1941 was not only beyond its resources, but also beyond its understanding. Having examined why the Japanese lost, the next step is to consider the impact of that loss. Much like identifying the true reasons for failure, Evaluating the importance of the Battle of Midway is a slippery proposition. For an engagement often labelled the decisive battle of the Pacific War, this is inevitable great battles by definition spawn a wealth of downstream consequences, each of which can be looked at independently. Accordingly, answers to the question what Midway really meant typically come in three varieties material, strategic and counterfactual. The first focuses on the importance of such things as aircraft losses, the loss of skilled aircraft mechanics, and the size of Japan's pilot training programs. The second analyzes what effect the defeat at Midway had on Japan's strategy for the remainder of the war. The third seeks to illustrate the importance of Midway by creating what-if scenarios, some well thought out, some verging on the delusional that changed the outcome of the Second World War in some way depending on the outcome of this one battle. All of these will be considered in turn, yet, within the scope of an operational-based study such as this one, the first imperative is to consider what it meant to Japan to lose the services of four aircraft carriers. The question might better be phrased in terms of what it meant to lose two carrier divisions, in particular carrier divisions one and two. Stated this way, the question acknowledges that the Japanese Navy had brought the concept of multi-carrier operations to a higher level of practice than any other Navy. It also emphasises that what was lost was not just X number of ships, planes or men, but rather a well-functioning assemblage of the three. Carrier Divisions 1 and 2 were incredibly complex weapon systems, forged through years of training and experimentation. All the material elements composing these systems need to be considered when assessing the damage suffered on 4 June 1942. There has been a tendency when analysing the battle to both under and overestimate the importance of these material factors. For instance, most early accounts of the battle casually assumed that the sinking of the Japanese carriers ipso facto destroyed the cream of Japan's carrier aviators and therefore put a stop to Japanese expansion. The truth is more complex, works such as John Prados's Combined Fleet Decoded 
have corrected the record by noting that the battle itself did not signal the end of the Japanese Naval Aviator Corps. This view is directly supported by the carrier's operational records. Kaga suffered 21 aircrew deaths, both in the air and on board ship, Soryu 10, and Akagi, a mere 7. Hiryu's air group was the exception, suffering casualties in excess of 50%, with 72 fatalities, including her air group leader and many officers. Included with these must also be the 11 floatplane crewmen who perished. However, the deaths of 121 airmen, though painful, did not constitute a disaster in itself. In fact, Japan would lose a similar number of aviators, 110, at the Battle of the Eastern Solomons in August 1942, and two dozen more than that, 145 at the Battle of Santa Cruz in October 1942. The losses at Midway certainly did not radically degrade the fighting capabilities of Japanese naval aviation as a whole which probably boasted around 2,000 carrier-qualified aircrew at the beginning of the war. Rather, it would take the hellish attrition of the Solomons campaign to initiate a fatal downward spiral in Japanese carrier aircrew proficiency, with the Battle of Santa Cruz marking the effective end of the elite pre-war cadres. Prados also notes the negative effects that losing hundreds of highly skilled aircraft mechanics and technicians had on the Imperial Navy. The Midway carriers between them counted 721 aircraft technicians killed, or more than 40% of the total number embarked. These men were difficult to replace, given Japan's less mechanized society than that of its foe, the United States. Their loss, in conjunction with the large number of skilled technicians, who were later to be isolated and effectively lost at Rabul during the Solomon's campaign, would have a direct impact on Japan's ability to field a modern carrier aviation force during the battles of 1944. To the toll of mechanics might also be added the deaths of other essential crewmen, such as flight deck crew, armourers, and other personnel involved in supporting flight operations. These men had trained together for years to reach the highest level of operational proficiency the Japanese Navy would ever attain. This attrition in personnel points to a more abstract loss namely that of organisational knowledge. It is not possible simply to conjure up 3,000 men, 150 aircraft and two carriers and expect them to operate smoothly. Shokaku and Zuikaku discovered this during the early phases of the war. Their tardy rearming operations in the Indian Ocean had certainly caused Nagumo considerable distress. Likewise, while recovering the final strike of 8 May at the Battle of the Coral Sea, a lack of deck handling speed on board Zuikaku had forced the jettisoning of a dozen precious aircraft over the side in order to recover the remainder of the planes still aloft. Thus, even several months after being commissioned, it is clear that Carrier Division 5 was still not operating at the same level as Carrier Division 1 and 2, despite having spent much of its time in company with the veteran carriers. Eventually, Shokaku and Zuikaku would both exhibit a very high level of operational ability, but reaching that level took a long time. At a point in the war when Japan needed to be fighting as audaciously and efficiently as possible, the void left by the loss of two senior carrier divisions could not be filled by more junior practitioners. All of these points have merit. Aircraft were certainly precious to Japan at this point in 1942 and the collective worth of human, organisational and tactical capital must certainly be borne in mind, particularly in a war in which the Japanese so frequently squandered these important commodities. But the point that gets lost in all this is the critical significance of the flight decks themselves. It's almost as if the rush to acknowledge the importance of pilots and airplanes to the new mode of warfare has blinded modern observers to the overwhelming importance of the aircraft carrier as a strategic naval asset. Without flight decks to deliver planes and pilots into combat, the naval aviation revolution was negated, because at a fundamental level, power projection absolutely requires a base from which to project it. And it was this mobile base that was by far the most expensive and least expendable component in the overall system. Japan began the war with nine carriers. Six of them, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Shokaku and Zuikaku, were fleet carriers, large and fast enough to operate a credibly sized air group. The other three were light carriers Hosho, Ryujo and Zuiho. Of these three, 
Hosho was old, tiny, and slow. Ryujo was scarcely better, being cramped, structurally suspect, and possessed of but a single suitable elevator. Of the three, only Zuiho was truly capable of being integrated into the main carrier fleet. By the time of Midway, Japan had already commissioned, and then lost Zuiho's equally useful sister Shoho, at the Battle of the Coral Sea, Japan had also commissioned Junyo and Hayo. Converted ocean liners, they were larger than the light carriers, and could actually mount a decent-sized air group. However, they were possessed of cranky hybrid power plants, composed of military boilers mated with commercial-type turbines that produced suboptimal speeds. As a result, while they were used in the role for want of anything better, they were hardly adequate replacements for true fleet carriers, and the reality was that the smaller Japanese carriers could only play bit parts in the Pacific War. This is not to say that they weren't useful, they were certainly welcome additions for supporting amphibious landing operations, and they could provide a limited local air presence, but they came with many drawbacks, the most fundamental being the small size of their air groups. Carrier air groups are subject to economies of scale. They need to be large enough to scout and to supply defensive fighters to protect the mothership, and still be able to deliver a large offensive punch. Delivering a single attack with, say, 32 attack aircraft is almost always superior to sending in two separate 16 plane attacks, because larger strike forces have a better chance of saturating the enemy's defences. Having a single carrier large enough to launch a decisive strike on its own was an important advantage in this respect. With an air group of 20 to 30 aircraft, light carriers simply did not have enough planes to go around. They could barely screen themselves, let alone deliver an attack of credible size. Furthermore, the shipboard infrastructure necessary to support the air group repair shops, command and control facilities, fueling stations, magazines and bomb storage rooms was also more efficiently delivered via a larger ship. Not only that, but it was easier to provide adequate escorts for a single large warship than for two smaller ones mounting the same number of aircraft, a critical factor in a navy as short of destroyers as Japan's. For all these reasons, deploying two light carriers did not produce the effectiveness or efficiency of a single fleet carrier with an air group of more than 60 aircraft. Light carriers could only complement, not replace, the functions of the fleet carriers, and with the exception of Zuiho, None of them were really worth the extra effort of slowing the fleet carriers down in order to have them around. Viewed in this light, it is apparent that the coin of naval power in the Pacific War must be measured by the number of fleet carriers available to the opposing navies. Reckoned this way, Japan started the war at something like parity with the United States Navy. The United States Navy fielded five large carriers, Lexington, Saratoga, Yorktown, Enterprise and Wasp, to Japan's six. By the time of Midway, the addition of Hornet had been negated by the loss of Lexington, as well as heavy damage to Saratoga, leaving the score 6-4 to four in favour of Japan. The number of naval aircraft carried by these respective forces only slightly favoured the Japanese, though, because of the larger American air groups. After Midway, however, the ratio was 3-2 to two in favour of the United States, a significant shift. The importance of these vessels is even more obvious, considering that each of them represented a phenomenal expenditure of national resources. At the time of their completion, Akagi and Kaga were by far the most expensive warships ever built for the Japanese Navy to that date, costing roughly 53 million yen apiece to complete. In terms of specific cost that is cost per tonne of displacement, they were twice as expensive as a battleship of the same era. This was a result of the intricate nature of carrier design, including the provision of complex pumping and aviation gasoline systems, elaborate damage control equipment, and the emplacement of defensive guns and their associated fire control systems. In Akagi's and Kaga's cases, these costs were driven even higher by the redesign efforts necessary to convert existing capital ship hulls into functional carriers. Each had also undergone comprehensive multi-year refits in the 1930s, consuming millions more. Soryu and Hiryu, with their relatively modest price tags of 40,200,000 yen, must have seemed like bargains when they were completed in 1937 and 1939. To these basic procurement costs, of course, must also be added the price of their air groups 
and the annual costs of operation. Accordingly, any analysis of the midway battle that fails to accord the proper gravity to losing the core component of a national defence capability that was 14 years in the making, that is, Kido Butai utterly misjudges the nature of the Pacific War. Big carriers didn't just grow on trees. Losing four of them in an afternoon was tantamount to a national disaster. Particularly within the time frame of the short conflict Japan hoped to fight, these losses were crushing and utterly irredeemable. One might contend that the losses in aircrew and or aircraft were of similar magnitude, but neither of these arguments is supportable. Of the two, the case for human capital perhaps has more merit, in that Japanese carrier aircrewmen were, at the time, among the most highly trained aviators in the world. The airmen lost at Midway would certainly have been useful in forthcoming carrier battles in the Solomons. However, it is worth remembering that 74 of these men were killed in the air, doing what carrier airmen are supposed to do, that is, attacking the enemy or defending the fleet. Even if Japan had won the Battle of Midway with their carriers unscathed, these men would still have been dead. Only the remaining 36 were shipboard fatalities.